Thank you again for, for joining us wherever you may be, uh, whether it's around the world, whether it's in a jail cell or whether it's in a combat you know, field or wherever it may be. Um, I feel like I believe the Lord has you listening and watching, um, either live or this recording later on. Um, and the Lord has you listening and watching for a reason and purpose. So I hope you're blessed and let us know. Let us know if you have been blessed and, and share it. So last week, as many of you know, if you've been with us, we, I gave a thorough introduction to uh, the book, Old Testament book of Joshua. I gave you as much information as I possibly could with the time that we had about its history, what's going on at the time, who Joshua was, um, what's been going on prior to, to this book, prior to the beginning of this book. Um, and if you maybe, are, as we begin now, uh, our chapter by chapter uh, study of the book of Josh Joshua, if you have any questions or you're kind of lost in the sauce, um, I just ask you to, re I, I want to refer back to the introduction. It may answer a lot of your questions that you may have. But here now as we begin uh, Joshua chapter 1, we're going to get now to the calling, the commission of Joshua to lead the people of Israel into the promised land. And many of you have heard the saying, you know, leaders aren't chosen, they're called. And it's one of those things I, I've seen it happen where you know, someone can just be doing nothing and next thing you know they're God has called them, and, and they're, they're leading, they're doing all kinds of stuff, and, and um, that's what God does. And we'll get, I'll get more into that as I get into this study, but um, over time, God definitely prepared Joshua for this moment, for this time, and he prepared the people as well. And as we go through this, uh, these verses I'm going to cover this morning, we're also going to see how it applies to us, to you, individually and as a church here. Um, you may hear some things that maybe you feel called to the ministry or you feel called to lead, to, to be a leader in, in the church, whether it's here or wherever you're, you're, you're currently um, at. But um, it may, this study here may help you, um, and you'll see some, how, how it may apply to you. But um, I wanted to share with you the main theme here. The main theme of this, these verses we're going to be reading is Christ, our new beginning, brings us out of the wilderness of sin through the power of the Spirit to do the work of the kingdom of God. So before I begin reading the um, first part of our passage, let's pray and ask the Lord to speak to us. Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning, and thank you for all you've done in our lives. Thank you for your grace and your mercy, and you know, it's just the beauty of everything you've done, everything you've created. Sometimes we forget or we overlook just the beauty of you, all that you've done for us, the blessings, you know, just the fact that we have breath in our lungs, and we're able to hold those that we love and care about. Lord, I, so now, Lord, I, I just pray that you will um, be glorified in this time. As we get into your word, share the message that you helped me to prepare. May we see exactly what you want us to see and hear the words that you want us to hear, Lord. May be free of all distractions, Lord, for just for the next few moments that we have together. May also change lives and hearts of those that may be watching this somewhere that they feel maybe trapped or lonely. Do a work, Lord, and we know you are confident of that because you are a good God and you do, we know we've seen you do some great and amazing things. So uh, fill this room again with your spirit, Lord. Protect us. Keep us safe. 
We look forward to hearing from you now. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Joshua chapter 1, verse 1. And the Word of God says, After the death of Moses, the Lord's servant, the Lord spoke to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant is dead. Now you and all the people prepare to cross over to the Jordan to the land I am giving the Israelites. I have given you every place where the sole of your feet treads, just as I promised Moses. Your territory will be from the wilderness and Lebanon to the great river, the Euphrates River, all the land of the Hittites and west to the Mediterranean Sea. No one will be able to stand up against you as long as you live. I will be with you just as I was with Moses. I will not leave you or abandon you. Be strong and courageous, for you will, be, you will distribute the land as I swear, swore to their fathers to give to them, to give them as an inheritance. As I mentioned in the beginning, this book begins with God's commissioning of Joshua, the calling to lead, to lead the people of Israel into the promised land. Now, a lot has happened up to this point. For 40 years, Moses had led Israel in the Sinai wilderness and had experienced supernatural providence such as the supply of manna, water from the rocks, the pillar of cloud by day, by day and fire by night, and so forth. During that time also, they, the people received divine revelation, the Mosaic Law, where God communicated to them His holy standard, the law. So from Exodus to Deuteronomy, Moses had been a towering figure that everyone looked for, looked to for guidance and leadership. In fact, the very end of Deuteronomy, the last two verses, affirms the impact and legacy of Moses' ministry and leadership. There it says, No prophet has arisen again in Israel like Moses whom the Lord knew face to face. He was unparalleled for all the signs and wonders the Lord sent him to do against the land of Egypt, to Pharaoh, to all his officials and all his land, and for all the mighty acts of power and terrifying deeds that Moses performed in the sight of all Israel. So again, as you can see, Moses was big. Moses was hard act to follow, a hard prophet, hard leader to follow. And so now, as a new generation of God's people camped east of the Jordan with their eyes aimed west towards Canaan, they kept looking at that and were saying, that's our future home. Their eyes were just aimed and focused there knowing that that was going to be their future home. And by this point now, they absolutely believed that God had a plan to make that all happen. The opening statement in verse 1, after the death of Moses, signals a couple of things. Prior to his death, Joshua um, was designated as Moses' successor. And so even though Moses was dead, God's purpose was still alive. And Joshua was now the key figure to fulfill God's program. And secondly, Moses' death signaled that there comes a time in every ministry when God calls for a new beginning with a new generation and new leadership. See, except... Joshua and Caleb, the old generation of Jews, had perished during the nation's wanderings in the wilderness. And it would be Joshua 
who would be the one that would lead the new generation into a new challenge, entering and conquering the promised land. Someone once said, God buries his workmen, but his work goes on. So you see, it was God who had chosen Joshua, and everyone in Israel knew that he was their new leader. Verse 1 also tells us that Moses, Moses' assistant was Joshua, and that he had served, Exodus does tell us that he served Moses for a number of years. And so the point here is that Joshua learned how to obey as a servant before he commanded as a general. He was first a servant and then a ruler. To keep point there. He, um, Aristotle wrote this, he who has never learned to obey cannot be a good commander. Now Joshua may have, during this time, may have felt maybe a sense of loneliness as he waited expectantly near the Jordan River to hear the voice of God. But when it finally did come, he wasn't disappointed. See, when God's servants take time to listen, he, God, always communicates in the present age, the day we live in today, he usually speaks through his word. But in the Old Testament time, he spoke in dreams by night, in visions by day, through the high priest, and occasionally in an audible voice. Now, in whatever way God communicated with Joshua, the message came through clearly. After mentioning the death of Moses, God commissions Joshua to achieve three things. Lead the people into the land, defeat the enemy, and claim the inheritance. Now, God could have sent an angel to do this, but he chose to use a man and give him the power he needed to get the job done. As I mentioned in uh, our introduction last week, Joshua is a type of Jesus Christ, the captain of our salvation, who has won every victory and now shares his spiritual inheritance with us. Now, as we read this, you read this first part, you may be thinking to yourself that it just isn't right it doesn't sound right, it doesn't seem right that for one group of people to go into a land that doesn't belong to them and displace them, to kick them out and, you know, and all that. But let me just say this to those who may be thinking that or have questions about that. Us people, we're no one to question God's right to give anything to anyone he, that he wants. In this case here, giving Canaan to the Israelites, since he is the one who owns all the earth. It's his. Everything is his. So he has a right to give and take away. And that's what he chose to do here. As the psalmist later affirmed in Psalm 24, 1, the earth and everything in it, the world and its inhabitants, belong to the Lord. Now, since Joshua had a threefold task to perform, God gave him three special promises, one for each task. God would enable Joshua to cross the river and claim the land. See that in verses 3 and 4. Defeat the enemy in verse 5. And apportion the land to each tribe as its inheritance in verse 6. Now God didn't give Joshua explanations as, as to how he would accomplish these things. Because God's people live on promises and not 
on explanations. You see, friends, when you trust God's promises and step out in faith, you can be sure that the Lord will give you the directions you need when you need them. He surely showed me that several times, and then maybe he showed you. Maybe you've stepped out in faith, not, suring, not, not sure what, what's to come, but when you did that, God led, and he showed you, and he gave you the directions that you needed. But now, let me take some time into, to, to just get into each one of these three promises. First, God promised Joshua that Israel would enter the land. Over the centuries, God had reaffirmed this promise from his first words to Abraham to his last words to Moses. God would, would take them over the Jordan and into enemy tor- territory and then would enable them to claim the land for themselves, the land that he had promised them. See, God had already given them the land. It was their responsibility now to step out, and f- step out in faith, by faith, and claim it. The same promise of victory that God had given to Moses, he affirmed to Joshua. And he carefully defined the borders of the land. Israel, though, didn't reach that full potential until the reigns of David and Solomon. And so the lesson for God's people today, the lesson for us, is that God has given us all spiritual blessings in Christ. And we must step out in faith and claim them. He has set before his church an open door that nobody can close And we must walk through that door by faith and claim new territory for the Lord. See, it's impossible to stand still in the Christian life and service. For when you stand still, you immediately start going backwards. Let me repeat that because I I think that phrase is so important. It's impossible to stand still in the Christian life and service. When you stand still, you immediately start going backwards. Let us go on is God's challenge to his church. And that means moving ahead into new territory. Secondly, God also promised Joshua victory over the enemy. The Lord told Abraham that other nations were inhabiting inhabiting the promised land. And he repeated this fact to Moses. If Israel obeyed the Lord, he promised to help them defeat those nations. But he warned his people. He warned them not to compromise with the enemy in any way. For, it, for, then, uh, for then Israel would win the war, but lose the victory. And unfortunately, this is exactly what happened. Since the Jews began to worship the gods of those pagan neighbors and adopt their evil practices, God had to, cha- had to chasten Israel, had to punish them in their land to bring them back to himself. You see that in Judges chapter 1 and 2. Now, in addition to promising victory, God also gave Joshua another promise, wonderful promise, at the end of verse 5. I will be with you just as I was with Moses. I will not leave you or abandon you. God had given a similar promise to Jacob in Genesis 28. And Moses had repeated the same promise to Joshua in Deuteronomy chapter 31. God would one day give the same promise to Gideon in Judges 6. And to the Jewish exiles returning from Babylon to their land in Isaiah 41. And then also to and David would also give it to his to his son Solomon in 1 Chronicles chapter 28. But here's what's best of all, church. God has given this promise to his people. 
to you and to me. The Gospel of Matthew opens up with, in, in chapter 1, verse 23, Emmanuel, God with us, and closes with Jesus saying, I am with you always, in chapter Matthew 28. Even the writer of Hebrews, Hebrews 13, verse 5, it quotes Joshua, chapter 1, verse 5, and applies it to Christians today. I will never leave you or abandon you. This means, friends, this means, church, and this should excite you that God's people can move forward in God's will and be assured of God's presence. We're told in Romans chapter 8, verse 31, if God is for us, who is against us? God's third promise to Joshua was that he would divide the land as an inheritance for conquering, uh, for the conquering tribes. This here was the assurance that the enemy would be defeated and that Israel would possess their land. God would keep his promise to Abraham that his descendants would inherit the land. The book of Joshua records a fulfillment of these three promises. The first in chapters 2 to 5. The second in chapters 6 through 12. And the third in chapters 13 through 22. And at the close of his life, Joshua could remind his leaders, his leaders in Israel, that, and it says this in chapter 23, verse 14, none of the good promises of the Lord, none of the good promises the Lord your God has made to you has failed. Everything was fulfilled for you. Not one promise has failed. See, before God could fulfill his promise. However, Joshua had to exercise faith and be strong and of good courage. Divine sovereignty is not a substitute, is not a substitute for human responsibility. God's sovereign word is an encouragement to God's servants to believe God and obey his commands. And so just as we saw the first part, now, just as we saw the first part dealt with Joshua's commission to take over after the death of Moses, and this next section we're about to read is the major thrust, verses 6 through 9, and concerns everything that was vital to Joshua's ability to do that. And what was true for Joshua is equally true for us. So let's go back to our passage, if you still have your Bibles open. And I'll begin again with, in verse 6. Joshua chapter 1, verse 6. Be strong and courageous, for you will distribute the land I swore to their fathers to give to them as an inheritance. Above all, be strong and very courageous to observe carefully the whole instruction my servant Moses commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, so that you will have success wherever you go. This book of instructions must not depart from your mouth. You are to meditate on it day and night, so that you may carefully observe everything written in it. For then you will prosper and succeed in whatever you do. Haven't I commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. As you might have seen, if you picked up on it, there's a word or a theme that is repeated at least three times in these verses that we need to pick up on and relate to. Three times God tells Joshua, be strong and courageous. There in verse 6, 7, and 9. And so the issue before Joshua was a call to be strong and courageous in view of the mantle of leadership that was being passed on to him. See, God was calling him to be uh, to a very special and difficult ministry. 
one with tremendous challenges and obstacles far beyond his own skill and abilities. And maybe for some of us, life is filled with such challenges. For many of us, all of us, life is filled with such challenges. So let us not pass over this without seeing the personal application this can have for all of us, for all of you. Verses 6 through 9 are fundamental for obtaining the strength and courage anyone needs for the challenges of any ministry or responsibility. Again, don't, let me just be clear. Not just ministry, but responsibility. Not just responsibility, but also for those of you who maybe are called into the ministry or are leading a ministry or are going to lead a ministry. Again, it's these verses here are fundamental in how to get the strength and courage to do those things, to lead in those areas. This passage is, is not just for a special class of leaders like pastors or missionaries. God has called each of us to ministry. No believer is exempt. We're all gifted, my fellow believer, my brother and sister in Christ. You're all gifted. We're all priests of God and leaders in some sense with personal responsibilities to others whether elders, deacons, moms, and dads, etc., etc. People often run from ministry or difficult situations because of fear or because of obstacles. As the former generation of Israelites had failed to enter the land and possess their possessions because of unbelief and fear of the giants, so we too can fail to enter into God's calling on our lives. Here's what I want to get across in in the second part of the passage we read. Without God's strength, personal courage, and personal courage, we will fail to tackle the challenges or take on the responsibilities that God calls us to. Others, being overconfident in themselves, may seek to strike out in their own uh, steam, an equally wrong way to serve the Lord, as we see illustrated in chapter 7 with the defeat of Ai. And we'll get there when we get to that chapter, but they tried to do it on their own. Biblically speaking, Where does moral strength and courage come from? And does it mean the absence of fear? fear? It's a question that we're going to be answering, that we'll be answering here. Moral strength and courage come from, one, faith in the sovereignty, sovereignty and provision of God, and two, the fact that we are convinced that what we're doing is right and best and essential to life. Let me repeat that if, in case you missed that. Moral strength and courage come from, one, faith in the sovereignty and provision of God, and two, in the fact that we are convinced that what we're doing is right, best, and best, and essential to life. But there's so much more as this passage will show us, or is showing us. Courage is that quality that enables men and women to encounter danger and difficult with firmness and resolve in spite of those inner fears. In other words, courage is not the absence of fear. While not, while not courting danger or presuming On the Lord, Paul never evaded something if he knew that it was God's will or that it was right. In his excellent book on spiritual leadership, J. Oswald Sanders wrote, 
courage is the highest order is demand the courage of the highest order is demanded of a spiritual leader always moral courage and frequently physical courage as well but not everyone is courageous by nature and the fact and that fact is both explicit and implicit in scripture the highest degree of courage is seen in the person who is most fearful but refuses to capitulate to it. However fearful they might have been, God's leaders in succeeding generations have been commanded to be of good courage. Had they been without fear, the command would have been pointless. So now, again, the next question that comes up, where do strength and courage come from? Well, these, conf- these concepts te- teach us several important ingredients. First of all, strength and courage come through recognizing and relating to God's pleasure, His will, and having a sense of God's calling and destiny knowing God's word, the clearly revealed will of God, plus recognizing one's gifts, abilities, and training, all of which are part of understanding his pleasure or will for one's life, is foundational for finding strength and courage to accept any area of responsibility in ministry. Now, without this understanding, one will hardly have the motivation or courage to move in the ministries God wants to call us to. There is, there is a specific process to be noted here in verses 1 through 9, the entire passage we covered. There is first God's word to Joshua, commissioning him and encouraging him. Encouraging him. The courage that is called for here is the direct result of the word and knowing God's will. Also, Joshua is reminded that he had been prepared and trained for this as Moses' servant, as a servant of Moses. Joshua being spoken to in verse 1 is equivalent to biblical insight It is this form, it is this that forms the foundation for courage and conviction and for faith and action. And so individually, as a Christian and as a church, we need to pray, always pray, and seek God's will and wisdom. The first foundation for courage is knowing both the word and God's will. Also, being the understudy, being the servant of Moses, illustrates a couple of key principles. Number one, the principle of having a, good, a godly example. And two, the principle of Luke chapter 16, verse 10, and its impact on the development of development of courage, and the motivation for ministry. Joshua had been faithful in the little things and would be faithful in much. Service in the larger areas of responsibility starts with faithfulness in the smaller things. All of us, each of us, need to find a place to serve to grow. It may become the training ground for other areas of ministry to which God may be calling you. Again, in verse 2, it says, Moses, my servant, is dead. This statement reminds us that no one, no one is indispensable and leadership changes for not training others the leaders here at the the church for not training others 
and being trained ourselves, we leave gaping holes. Now, therefore, arise, emphasize the need for decisive action to fill the void left by Moses' absence. And all this is true for all of us in ministry. For whatever reason, there's a void left by the removal of one of God's servants. A true grasp of the need is always a vital element to decisiveness and action to fill that need. It's part of the root that produces the fruit. But there's another another element that is vital to courage and decisiveness in doing the will of God. So number two, strength and courage comes through resting, resting in God's promises. We see that in verses, the second half of verse two and through six. Take note of this, that the promises given to Joshua here were given in relation to the ministry and work to which God had called him. This applies to each of us, regardless of the particular ministry God has called us to in the body of Christ. Again, read these verses, read those verses carefully and and see what application you can make from them to your life. Do you feel a tug of God on your life to serve him in a particular way? But are you afraid? Are you afraid of failure? Are you afraid of what it might cost you? So again, ask you, meditate on these verses, on verses uh, 2 to 6. Now we might also note some obstacles that can be observed in this passage because claiming the promise, the promises of the God, uh, the promises of God, faith must face the obstacles. The first obstacle is cross the Jordan. In Scripture, the, jo- the Jordan often represents an obstacle, an impediment to growth, ministry, progress. There's good reason to believe that the Jordan was swollen over its banks at this time of the year when this, we see this story taking place. Furthermore, to cross the Jordan meant to enter into hostile land, a land full of enemies, some of whom were giants and who lived in strongly fortified cities. So this was no simple challenge. I remember the first generation failed at Kaddish Bar- uh, Barnea because of a lack of courage. But there's more here. You and all the people. This was no small group. This wasn't just a group of people the size of our, our church here. The very, num- the very numbers made this a colossal task. But Joshua had the responsibility of leading a people who were noted for being stiff-necked and throwing stones at their leaders. The word all reminds us that, reminds that, that it is God's purpose for all his people to mature and become strong, to be in his will and living in living uh, victorious lives. Nevertheless, regardless of the obstacles, obstacles, God's will had been clearly made known, had been clearly made known to Joshua. He needed to act by faith in the Lord's person, promises, and provision. Let's look at that promise again in the second half of verse two to the land I am giving the Israelites. Now also look at the words in verse 3. I have given you. They were going into the promised land. The land promised to the patriarchs, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or Israel, by God himself, who cannot go back on his promises 
In fact, he was then and had for some time been, been, been preparing the inhabitants for defeat, those people that were already living in that land. And so the land had been theirs for 40 years while they were living and wandering in the wilderness, but they failed to enter in because of unbelief and lack of courage. God's words, God's word, my friend, is filled with hundreds of promises. But we must know, you must know those promises and act on them by faith. God's promises are given to carry us through the Jordan rivers of life. Not necessarily remove them, but to enable us to step out in faith to cross them. They're not given so that we can avoid or go around, but so that we can cross them victoriously. Victoriously. So how do we claim those promises? How do we make those promises a part of our lives? This leads me to the third way we gain strength and courage. Strength and courage come through daily renewal in God's principles. See that there in verses 7 and 8. Successful ministry, according to the biblical definition of success, is ultimately related to solid Bible teaching and study rather than our human methods, techniques, and strategies which too often resort to pressure, co coercion, and manipulation in order to achieve our own agendas or results. The word intrinsically, powerfully, the word is intrinsically powerful and able to produce godly change in believers, in believers' lives as it motivates, encourages, gives hope, and direction, and exposes us to both our needs and God's provision. The word has been given to us to establish a communicative relationship with God. It is a means of fellowship with him. But this takes time, my friends. It takes time takes time, quality, and diligence. Note the emphasis on, in these verses to observe carefully the whole instruction. Do not churn from it. You are to meditate on it day and night. But again, what is our tendency? The average person today, they want it right now. They want a quick fix. You want those three easy steps. You want God to do it now. But this kind of approach doesn't develop a relationship with God. Relationship with God, knowing Him, as with any relationship, relationship it, it takes time. It is this that provides us with success in ministry and in life. Wherever we go and whatever we do. So again, what, what I see here too, what I want to mention is maybe you're, you want to serve right away. You want to, you know, you want it right now. Maybe right now the Lord is just calling you just to be patient, to wait, to hold on, you know, just to, there, there, there will come a time and there will come an opportunity but in the meantime, just allow him to work in your life, to speak to you, to work out those kinks, work out those, those areas in your heart, in your life that are going to be harmful to the ministry. I've seen how quickly ministries can break apart, fall apart when ambition gets in the way, when the self gets in the way. 
and there is no serious uh, development of, of a relationship with the Lord. Now, in these verses, Joshua was warned or he was cautioned in three things. To observe carefully in verse 7, warns against the danger, calls for prudence, observation, or careful scrutiny. The whole instruction points to the concept of the entire, the entirety of the word, the word of God, the whole instruction. To not turn from it, point to the concept of Scripture as our objective index or standard and warns against moral relativity. And Joshua was to do three things with regard to Scripture. First, the law was not to depart from his mouth. He was to talk about it. This would be a means of staying occupied with God's thoughts and ways. He was to meditate on it day and night. He was to think about it constantly in order to be able to talk about it and apply it. One must know it and see how it applies. Read it. When you read God's word, find out how it applies to, to you personally. You must have it on our mind and heart to fortify, encourage, and direct. And third, he was to do everything written in it. He was to conduct his life in obedience to all its commands. Fourth, strength and courage come through reckoning on God's person and presence. So again, uh, Last, but certainly not least, is the promise of the ever-watchful and protective presence of God. There is no situation, no situation at all, no problem or enemy that we will ever face alone, that you will ever face alone, whatever that may be. Again, the situation or the problem or the, the enemy, you will never face it alone. The Lord will always be there. The Lord is always there as our constant support and supply. If we're concerned about, if you're concerned about your ministries or anything else, we can be absolutely sure God is infinitely more concerned than you are. Our need is to simply walk in the light of his presence and to count on his guidance, support, supply, and care by keeping our focus on him. Haven't I commanded you? He, he also says, what's the point here? It's the source of the command and the promise and the promises. The I refers to Yahweh. So, again, note what follows after that. For the Lord, Yahweh, your God, Elohim, is with you, is with you wherever you go. These words stress the nature of the one who gave the command. They focus our attention on who and what God is like. So one of the secrets to boldness and courage is an awareness of God's provision and presence, especially his presence as the one who has promised to never, ever leave us. Compare John chapter 20, verse 19, and the fear of the disciples before they experienced the presence of the resurrected Christ with the promise of his never-ending presence and our presence with the boldness they displayed in Acts chapter 4, verses 13 through 20. 
what made the difference in the disciples. There were men who were now confident in Christ's presence. They knew God's will, his word, and they were filled with God's spirit. So you see, when the Holy Spirit is in control of a person's life and is instructing him or her in God's word, he imparts not a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. Again, 2 Timothy 1, chapter 1, verse 7 says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but one of power, love, and sound judgment. Some of, the, some of the, your Bible translation may say, again, instead of fear, timidity, and, um, and sound judgment as, as discipline. So you see, fear means cowardice, the opposite of courage. Power is dunamis, the ability to do what we should. Love is agape, a mental attitude of sacrificial concern for others. This means the motivation and ability to make tough choices. Sound judgment is discipline, a product of biblical understanding, which holds our fear in check, changes values and priorities, and gives courage and decisiveness. In Hebrews chapter 13, the author reminded his readers of the need of ministry to the saints. For instance, he wrote, Let the love of the brethren continue. Do not neglect to show hostility to strangers. God wants us to be ministering people and, and takes courage and obedient, obedience. God wants us to be ministering people, and this takes courage and obedience. And sometimes means sacrifices. So also, his, his, his cautions, he cautions us concerning our values and our sources of security, and then reminds us of the promises of the presence and supply of God. Almost done here, church. Thank you for, I hope you've been, you know, catching on, listening to everything I've been saying. Church, we're told in Hebrews chapter 13 there, verses 5 through 6, keep your life free from the love of money. Be satisfied with what you have, for he himself has said, I will never leave you nor abandon you. Verse 6, therefore, we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid what man can do for me. And so as we face the challenges and opportunities and calling of God, let's remember these promises of God to Joshua. With the call of God and service, with the call of God to service, there's always the matching provision of God. As has been said where God guides, he provides. The problem lies not with the Lord, but with our responsibility to follow the Lord's admonitions as given to Joshua. Now in the years to come, whenever Joshua faced an enemy and was tempted to be afraid, he would remember that he was a man with a divine commission and his fears would vanish. Whenever things went wrong and he was tempted to be dismayed, he would, go, he would call God's command and to take new courage and take new courage. Like Moses before him and Samuel and David after him, Joshua had a divine mandate to serve the Lord and to do his will. And that mandate was sufficient to carry him through. And I hope that if you know that you've been called by the Lord to, to do something, and he has called you and he's put you in that position, and you know that it's his, it's his will, Take courage, be strengthened with the fact that, again, he's called you there. 
and no one, nothing will remove you other than him. I mean, it's, you know, his will, his purpose for you to be there. And again, he will provide, he will guide you, he will strengthen you. And the fact, again, that he called you to that position will give you courage and will carry you through whatever obstacle, whatever challenges may come. Friends, God dwelt among his people as Emmanuel and delivered us from sin. The Spirit is given to empower us to do ministry. Joshua, son of Nun, anticipates Jesus, the Son of God. The name Jesus, which like Joshua, means Yahweh is salvation. Again, it says, we're told in Matthew chapter 1, you are to name him Jesus because he will save his people from his sins. Only Jesus, the great Joshua, will bring rest to his people, will bring you rest. The spirit of Yeshua exposes the rebellion and resistance in our hearts as Christ invites us into his rest. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11, Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Let me close with this quote from St. Augustine. Thou hast made us for thyself, and our souls cannot find rest until they rest in thee. Church, are you in that rest right now? Have you found that rest? That's excellent. Stay there. Don't allow the world or circumstances, situations to remove you from that rest. Because many of you already know what it's like outside of Christ. Many of you know how hard it is and how painful it is and how, how easy it is to get stuck back in that rut, in that pit. I have. And it's not a place where I want to be anymore. I do when I think about and I start to get tempted and I start to you know, see the things of the world and I'm like, oh, wouldn't that be nice? I remember that it all began with just a small little compromise. Oh, no one will know. No one will mind if I just have a drink here or there. <coughs> you know, no one will know if I take that, that bump, that line, if I take that pill or this pill, or if I watch that website or go to this bar or meet with this guy or girl. It's innocent. It doesn't mean anything. I'm okay. But again, one small compromise eventually does lead to a pit of destruction. Be very careful. You know, again, many of you may know already that you've been there before and you don't want to go back there. Stay in that rest. Be encouraged. Know, if, know that God has called you to a greater purpose, a greater reason for living. Continue to walk in that purpose and reason and be, courage, be encouraged that, again, God will give you the strength. God will give you the strength for whatever obstacle you're facing. I want to take a quick moment to talk to those who maybe they haven't found that rest yet and you want it and you, you, know, you just want to be able to boldly just say, you know what, Lord, uh, I, I want finally have peace and rest and I want to be able to live according to God's will. I'm tired of living in the world and for the world and it's not doing anything for me and you want those victories and you want to have eternal life. Well, I want to invite you to the cross. I want to invite you to the cross so you can bear your sins before the Lord and ask him to forgive you for all of it. He died for you. He died for your sins. He was nailed to the cross, not because of anything he did, but because 
of what you did, your sins. And he will forgive all of them, all of them, if you just surrender your life to him, if you hand your heart over to Jesus. And so if that's what you want to do at this very moment, again, whether you're here, you're watching, listening to this live, or later on, wherever you're at, you should bow your head and close your eyes. And with all your heart, with all sincerity, pray this. Or Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I admit it. And I ask you to forgive me. I believe that you died for my sins and three days later rose from the grave. So now I repent. I turn from my sins and confess you and you alone as my personal Lord and Savior. Jesus, thank you for dying for me. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for saving me. So now I ask you to fill me, fill my entire heart with the Holy Spirit so that he may help guide me and teach me and instruct me in my new born again life. In your name, amen. Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope we were blessed by Pastor Angel's message. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvccelp.com. If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.